Hey, what's up guys? Welcome to China Update, where we tell you the biggest developments coming out of China so you're on top of the world's number two economy. My name is Tony, and what a crazy week it's been. It's been a long week at the firm, but I am very happy to be with you guys now. I'm filming this on a Friday night here in my beautiful bedroom, as always. I'm going to film this, and then I'm going to go grab some pizza. I think I'm going to have pepperoni. I'm excited. If you're new to the channel and this is your jam, make sure you hit that subscribe button, hit that bell icon. We release one of these every week and we'd love to have you in the family. We'd love for you to come on board. We release every Saturday morning in the United States and Saturday evening in East Asia. And make sure you smash that like button to help us with the YouTube algorithm. Okay, let's jump in. Okay, first things first, let's talk about the trade agreement between Trump and Xi Jinping, the so-called phase one agreement. Now, this was supposed to be signed at the APEC conference in Chile, but this week the conference was canceled. Some have said that this is going to throw a spanner in the works. Actually, it's not really a big deal. Both sides do want to sign this agreement and actually leading up to the conference, the American side had released reports saying that they hadn't quite finished writing the draft agreement yet. We have to remember guys that the phase one agreement is essentially the low hanging fruit in the trade relationship. This is the easy stuff. It's about certain trade in exchange for not increasing barriers on Chinese goods and IP protections. And quite frankly, the IP protections isn't really that important. I assume that the American side knows that it's going to be difficult to implement anyway. And this is really one to give the Chinese a breather as they try and stabilize their economic growth and slow down that economic slowdown. And two, give Trump a win as he goes into an election year and allow money to go to the farming areas, which are of course his base. A lot of the tough structural parts of the relationship have not been touched with this agreement. Trump said on Thursday that they're already looking for a site to sign the agreement. So it is highly likely that an agreement will go through. The devil is in the detail, however, and if there is going to be an issue with this particular iteration of the agreement, it's going to not come down to the location or the IP place, but it's going to come down to how much did the Chinese agree to buy from the Americans when it comes to agro purchases. Trump has said on several occasions already that he asked for 40 to 50 billion. People like Merchant and Lighthouser, the, the US trade representative, have said that it's going to take some time for the Chinese to get to that point. So maybe it's not going to be automatic, but the expectation is that it's 40 to 50 billion. The Chinese have said that they're going to go back to pre-trade war levels, which is approximately 20 billion. But even that level, which is already below what the Trump administration has indicated is necessary for the trade to go across the line, is going to be difficult for the Chinese. Why? Since the trade war started in April of last year, Chinese pig industry, the swine industry, has been ravaged by African swine fever. And their swine numbers have dramatically been reduced by over 100 million pigs, which means they don't need as much soybean imports. And before the trade war started, 70% of Chinese agro purchases was in soybeans. So this would mean that they would either have to buy soybeans that they don't need, or they'd have to find something else to buy. Now, pork could be a good uh, replacement because they need pork. In fact, they need lots of protein meats. So this is going to be one of the points of contention, I think, exactly how much the Chinese are willing to buy. Another is also, the Chinese have said, in order to achieve a further agreement or to conclude the agreement, there has to be a complete reduction of all tariffs. There have been some reports even saying that the phase one agreement will not be signed unless the Americans both stop implementation of upcoming tariffs and remove all tariffs that were introduced since April of last year. This is something that the Trump administration said they will not do because they need those tariffs in place as leverage to ensure that the Chinese meet the obligations under the first agreement. So there is some disagreement here. In short, phase one trade agreement will probably happen. It is very narrow in scope, but the wider trade conflict is still ongoing and it is very unlikely going to be resolved anytime soon. Okay, now let's talk Hong Kong. Everything is in chaos in the fragrant harbor, but there are two things that we need to look at here. The first is Joshua Wong was disqualified from running in local elections. He, of course, rose to fame in the 2014 Umbrella Movement. Now, he was disqualified because according to the local law, a candidate running for local elections or any elections has to recognize the sovereignty of mainland China over Hong Kong. This development is most likely going to exacerbate the already terribly unstable situation in Hong Kong. Now, the second piece about Hong Kong is that the economy is in the toilet. Hong Kong is now in a technical recession. The three months, the quarterly growth in the three months leading up to September saw the Hong Kong economy reduce by 3.2%. This is a major reduction. Of course, one of the biggest industries to take a massive hit is tourism. Mainland Chinese tourists made up a massive percentage of tourists who would go to Hong Kong, stay at the hotels, 
go to the local restaurants and buy products duty free. It looks like that shrinking economy is going to continue and this is of course going to put tremendous strain on the Hong Kong dollar. The Hong Kong dollar is pegged to the US dollar and it has been since the 1970s. Now there's been a lot of strain on the Hong Kong dollar over the last 12 months. This was even before the beginning of the protests. Some people uh, have shorted the Hong Kong dollar thinking that the Hong Kong dollar is going to break. The peg is going to break against the US dollar. Of course this would have massive, massive effects for not just the Hong Kong economy but the wider Chinese economy because there is a lot of financial exposure between the Hong Kong financial industry and the mainland Chinese financial industry. Though Hong Kong is a small economy versus the mainland, its financial industry, its banking industry is still very, very big. And it is a way in which a lot of transactions are made between China and the outside world. And of course, China is a large trading trading nation. So the economy is slowing and it's putting strain on the Hong Kong dollar. Now our next piece this week was the fourth plenum of the CPC. This is basically when all the big head honchos of the Communist Party get together in Beijing and talk strategy and policy going forward. What was interesting about this particular plenum, the fourth plenum, is that it hadn't been held for about 20 months, which was the longest period between plenums in decades. Also, there have been a lot of rumors talking about, is she become too powerful? Is he not powerful enough? Is she finally going to implement all these liberalizing economic reforms? Is he going to double down on ideology? Again, these are just rumors. What we have to do is wait for the statement once the plenum concludes, and it has concluded. And what did they say? F*** all. They basically said that we discussed, we discussed, how are we going to improve governance? How are we going to improve the relationship between the central government and the local government for policy implementation? And how are we going to forge socialism with Chinese characteristics? So pretty boilerplate stuff. There were a couple of interesting things in the announcements though. One was discussion of the role of spiritual health or the cultural spiritual health of the Chinese nation and the role of both ideology and traditional Chinese culture in preserving that spiritual health. The other was a big focus on control of local governments when it comes to financial stability. Now the issues with local financing and debt issues is a big topic and I'm going to release a special on that. It's about 10 minutes just to unpack it. But this is one of the biggest structural issues that the Chinese Communist Party is facing. The issue of policy implementation at the local level, control over local governance, and a reduction in the structural issues when it comes to conflict of interest and corruption at the local level between local governments and local financial and corporate entities. These are big issues. So we will probably see policies down the road to try and combat this, but this has been an issue for 2,000 years in, in China, and I don't see it being fixed anytime soon. Though they might be using blockchain to fix it, and we'll be discussing that shortly. Now African swine fever is something that we've already discussed here before. If you click on the link below it will send you to a larger report where we discussed what exactly African swine fever is and what the effects it's going to be on the wider economy. What we do need to know here is that it continues to ravage China, the pork supply and of course pork and wider food inflation. About a month ago pork was rising in price by double digits a month. Last week it increased by 11% which means it is now increasing by double digits a week. African swine fever of course brought into China about a year or so ago. It started in Dongbei in the uh, Manchuria in the northeast and is now spread to every single province in the country. Has resulted in the culling of over 100 million pigs and pork has increased by some in some places 200 percent. This has been labeled as a major political issue by Hu Chunhua who is the vice premier uh, of the People's Republic of China and the propaganda apparatus has gone into overdrive to reassure Chinese citizens that everything is under control and please don't freak out about the price of food. They recognize the importance of food security when it comes to keeping the population happy and what they're the most frightened of is a pissed off population. They have a long history of peasant uprising and peasants typically don't uprise when they have a tummy full of dumplings. Now for our last story let's talk about some technology updates with 5G and blockchain. So this week China began the this week China began unrolling 5G for the first time. This was actually a few months ahead of schedule and you have some providers providing plans as low as 18 US dollars per month. Of course this is a relatively slow version and you're not going to get that much data but it is incredible to see this already being rolled out. I think this directive actually came from the top and it was assigned to the Americans in the context of the wider trade dispute that China is still investing and developing technology. It's also a big propaganda win for Huawei, which has of course been facing issues in the US market and potentially in the European market as well, showing off that 5G is here and we're already using it. 
Now, of course, the Chinese are not the first to roll out 5G for retail customers. South Korea, for example, rolled it out in April and some places in the US already have it. And 5G, of course, is going to be a big business in China. Early estimations show that somewhere between 200 and 250 billion is going to be spent on 5G infrastructure in China in the next five years alone. This is not market, this is not consumer spending, this is just infrastructure spending on 5G. And let's talk about blockchain. Everyone, of course, has been hyping about blockchain and now the president, Xi Jinping, is getting in on the action too. He actually led a Politburo uh, study session looking into blockchain technology and gave it his thumbs up of endorsement. Just like I hope you're going to smash that like button now if you're still with us. Thank you very much. Xi Jinping said that blockchain is going to be an important feature for the Chinese government going forward. What did he say? Now, Xi Jinping said that blockchain is going to be critically important for improving governance, pointing to blockchain's ability to record transactions perfectly in real time. This, of course, will help the Chinese government mitigate that age-old problem of local officials tampering with important economic data before it gets to the central government level. Better data will mean that it'll be easier to plan and implement policy going forward and will strengthen the central government's control over local governments when it comes to financial and regular policy implementation. Now some of you might be thinking, wait a minute, blockchain is decentralized. The Chinese won't be able to control this technology. Well, they said that about the internet and the Chinese have really nailed that one, for better or for worse, so I wouldn't be too sure. Okay guys, thank you so much for watching. There is a pepperoni pizza with my name on it. I hope you guys had a good week and that you can enjoy your weekend. Make sure you hit that subscribe button if you want to get our updates when they come out. Saturday night in Asia, Saturday morning in the United States. I'm Tony and I'll see you guys next time on China Update.